Programmers don't like repetitive code. The acronym DRY has been birthed into almost every programmer's brain from the moment they started to learn to code. And as a result, we have the tendency to seek out every possible way to generalize and simplify pieces of code. But at the same time, our code must be fast and optimized. So we tend to not apply these strategies when it comes to the actual implementation. Now, I'm not here to go into detail about how certain methods of achieving dry can impair performance. People have done it many times before me already. No, I'm here to talk about Haskell's way of generalizing building blocks of many implementations and how counterintuitively using them can sometimes yield code that performs better than a handwritten solution. Just like almost all languages, Haskell has a standard library called base. It contains the fundamental parts of the language as well as commonly used functions and type definitions. Now these function names can become quite cryptic, but luckily Haskell has a very useful tool for finding these functions called Hugo. In Hugo, you can search by function name, function type, and its containing module. The ability to search by type is especially useful since the type gives away a lot of information about what a function does. It is one of the best documentation sources I've ever seen for any programming language. For example, if we needed a way to print an integer to the console, we can look up integer to string. This gives us multiple results, uh, a lot of results that we are not particularly interested in, but we can use plus base to only show results in the base package. Typing in plus base integer to string gives us two results, and the bottom one, show, seems to be the one we need. You might have already tried passing functions as arguments before in a different language. This feature is also present in Haskell, and it is very easy to use. The right arrow operator in Haskell is right associative, so A to B to C would be interpreted as A to parentheses B to C. If we recall how partial application works, cutting off the first argument by filling it in, this makes a lot of sense. We would first apply argument A, then get a function in return, apply argument B, and then get the final value C. So in order to define function arguments in our type, we write a function within parentheses. This would be a function that takes a function a to b as an input and returns a value c. Functions like this that take other functions as arguments are called higher order functions. When feeding a function into another function, we can use name functions, but sometimes it is more convenient to inline the function definition somehow. Haskell makes this possible with what is called lambda notation. This code yields an anomalous function that adds two numbers x and y. And this way, we can inline the function definitions into arguments of other functions. A common pattern when working with lists is applying a function to every element in a list. Think of formatting a list of numbers to display them or just updating a list of objects according to some update function. We already talked about list comprehensions and how these provide a shorthand way of achieving this behavior without resorting to trivial recursion every time. However, there's an even shorter way to implement this behavior using a function with function arguments. The best way to understand most Haskell functions is to make them ourselves, so recall Hutton's methods from last video. Let's call our function apply for now, and it should take a unary function a to b, a list of elements of type a, and when each of these elements gets passed into the function, it becomes one of type b, so a return type will be a list of elements of type b. Now, the definition of the function we're passing in stays the same throughout the entire recursion tree, so we only need two cases for our list. And for lists, the cases are as follows. Defining the cases, the return type is going to be a list, so our base case should return empty list and our recursive case should return a cons. And it should then make sense that applying fn to x and applying apply with fn to the remaining x's gives us the desired behavior. Now, this function already exists in the standard library of Haskell. It is called map, and it is one of the most important and commonly used functions in the entire language. And this is because map solves a problem that is very common, mapping a function onto a list. Another way to think about map is to partially apply it. If we only feed a function into map, the resulting type will be list of A to list of B. So, in a way, Map creates this function on list from a function on elements. And this is noteworthy because it allows us to start thinking about functions like building blocks rather than actions or operations. 
large functions become more like machines made out of smaller functions, which are like Lego bricks. We will explore this idea of thinking about functions further in an upcoming video. For now, let's look at two more examples. Zip with takes two lists and combines the corresponding elements using a binary function. So zip with plus x's y's will give the pairwise sum of x's and y's. Its cousin, zip, combines the elements into tuple pairs. Filter takes a list and returns all the elements where the given function returns true for that element. So filter even x's returns all the even numbers in x's. So why is this so important? First and foremost, knowing that these functions exist and are probably already written for you by someone else, means you can drastically increase your productivity. Map solves a very simple problem in our case, but a more complex pattern like fold or scan can save you a lot of time. In some cases this can even improve performance. Since these functions are so general purpose, there's a good chance that their implementations are already heavily optimized. For example, the problem that map solves is embarrassingly parallel, and filter can be implemented using a divide and conquer strategy. And indeed, people already have written these standard library functions with things like hardware acceleration. In fact, the person who wrote this library was also my professor in concurrency and parallelism. Of course, case-specific optimizations are not taken into consideration with this approach. But if you have a deadline to meet, perfectly optimizing everything is pretty much infeasible. In those cases, being able to speed up your code without too much effort is very helpful. And you can always consult the source code for these functions whenever you need to optimize further. Lastly, higher order functions can improve code readability by hiding irrelevant implementation details and giving you a clear picture of what a function does. Of course, we can take this to the extreme and make our code borderline unreadable in the process, which is not good either. Having to look up what a certain function does is undesirable. So we should limit ourselves to those functions we think should be generally understood. In a way, it's like learning a language. Knowing more words can help convey an idea better and will sound more elegant. But at some point, people might have trouble understanding you. I only covered a few built-in functions today, but I will go through all of the important ones in the upcoming video. I encourage you, meanwhile, to experiment with these functions to gain an intuition about how and where they are useful. Higher order functions can be confusing for those who are new to declarative programming. Thinking in terms of these building blocks feels limiting compared to the granularity of imperative programming. But especially when it comes down to writing code quickly, I promise you, they are worth your time. 